My name is Jim Nash. I want to introduce myself real quick. Uh, I've been the Oakland County Water Resources Commissioner for um, coming on six years now. Uh, I started in 2013, first elected in 2012. Um, the, uh, before that, I was a county commissioner from Farmington Hills, so I've been on the board. I've been working with the county for almost 16 years now. Um, this has been, uh, uh, 14 years. This has been uh, really amazing, and I, and I have a, an amazing staff that I work with engineers all the way to laborers they just they have a they have a great attitude and we have a great relationship with the public um this is kind of you know brief thing of what i'm going to talk about here um you've probably heard of drain commissioners before drain commissioners have been around a long time 120 odd years now um we operate on the drain code of 1956 uh, there's been a few moderate little changes along the way but really it hasn't changed much since 1956 so it's the same age as I am. Um, we've been around a long time. Oakland County changed the water resources in 2009. Uh, there's about, I think, eight or nine counties across the state that have done that. Uh, Washtenaw, us, uh, Kent County, you know, the bigger counties that do way more than just drains. Um, originally, it was all about drains. It was about back in the early 1800s after the uh, um, War of 1812, the U.S. government wanted to give a whole bunch of land to, uh, to the soldiers, the folks who fought against the British. Um, so they, they started sending out survey teams. They sent out a survey team to um, Michigan, and they said it was a massive swamp. Nobody would ever want to live there. So we decided that uh, people did want to live there, so we started draining swamps. And so that's how really uh, drain commissioners came to be, is draining for agriculture. Nowadays, we do, there's still drains for agriculture, even in Oakland County, but mostly we do drains, we do sewer, water, all the things around all the, uh, the different areas we, we do here, um, and we do a lot of regional collaboration because we are Oakland County, but we're surrounded by the other counties, and we all are in the same boat here when it comes to water. So we have to collaborate with Macomb, Wayne, Washtenaw, all the counties around this area, and then up at Lansing and in the whole south, uh, the whole Midwest. We're all under these same things. Um, what happened to Lake Erie a few years ago was, was our responsibility, Ohio's responsibility, Canada's responsibility, all the things that led to that happening with the, the huge algae blooms back in 2014 um, was agriculture, was sewage, was all kinds of different things that happened, but we can control them. So that's what we do, and we work regionally to get it done. Um, please. Oh, sure, I can get you a copy. They're going to have a copy at the Royal Oak thing here. I can, if anybody's interested, I can send you a copy. Oh, great, thank you. Be happy to. I'll give out my cards when I'm done. Um, you know, everybody's aware of infrastructure. We have, we're heavily dependent on infrastructure in this part of Oakland County. And um, I just gave a talk up in uh, uh, Novi and, and that area, and a lot of folks there are on our infrastructure, but a lot of wells, a lot of things like that. There's not so much wells here or, or septic fields here in this area. You, you're on city water and you're on city sewers. So that's kind of how we things, we do things. But all our systems really across the country are anywhere from 75 to 100 years old. This, when it gets to this time, that means it's past its expected life expectancy and that's why we have issues a lot with infrastructure. I'll get to that in a minute too. Um, right now, the, the estimate is about $82 billion a year we need to invest in infrastructure, water infrastructure, just to keep up with what we've had and unless we want it to start getting worse water quality, we've got to start making these investments. This is na nationwide, but here in, in Michigan, uh, they're saying about two to three billion dollars a year need to be spent just in Michigan on, on water uh, infrastructure. Um, this is how you guys get water. Lake Huron is where almost all our water for Oakland County comes from. There's a source out there four miles out on the water, very pure water they bring in. They have right on shore, they have a major water um, treatment plant. Then it's sent in giant 15 foot or more um, pressurized water mains. It goes to Imlay City west from, from uh, Lake Huron and then down south to us. And then some of it branches up to, to uh, um, uh, Flint. Um, so when it, when it comes off the, the main lines out of water treatment plants, gets all the way down to our area. Um, there's booster stations along the way for pressure. Uh, once it hits a town, each in this area, every community directly contracts with the Great Lakes Water Authority for drinking water. When you talk about sewer things, we do, we do systems that are many communities across. Uh, but when it comes to water, they get, you get a single or maybe one or two or three hook-ins for every city from the mains. 
There's a meter here that measures out how much it's doing. We have a pressure reduction valve, then it's distributed to the smaller lines that go down everybody's street. From there, it goes into, into uh, uh, fire hydrants and it goes into your house. Um, service lines, we've heard a lot about service lines with lead. Lead is very common. Anything bef built before 1949, unless they've been released, uh, uh, replaced since then, most of them are going to have some at least solid lead or, or um, lead alloys that they use for piping. Because back in those days, lead is easy malleable. You can bend it, you can shift it around, um, and it was easier to plant. Um, so this is, this is pretty much how we all set up. Anybody that's on any kind of city water, I'm in Farmington Hills, we get the same thing in Farmington Hills. Um, this is pretty much how it's set up. These are the communities. These kind of things here, these, these things here, we have all here. If anybody's interested, we have copies over here if anybody wants to see these. Um, so the red areas, all the reds with the line here, this is all, they get their water from the Great Lakes Water Authority. This is you guys down here. So you go, everybody gets it from the Great Lakes Water Authority. Royal Oak purchases its water directly from the authority through the South Oakland Water Authority. So 15 communities contribute to, to pay for the water here. The more systems buy water at one time, the cheaper you can get it per unit. So it's, it saves a lot of money by doing that that way. Since I've been in office, we create the North Oakland Water Authority. This is, this is Orion, um, Pontiac, Auburn Hills, and uh, um, Rochester Hills. Now they all purchase their water together uh, as a unit instead of by each individual community and they're saving about three million dollars a year by doing that. So every time you're doing these kind of things, these kind of when you're getting together to buy water, you're going to save money. Um, a lot of communities do it there themselves. Uh, the blue communities are communities that my office operates and maintains for them through contract with the communities. Farmington Hills, from where I'm from, we contract. Commerce and Pontiac are our biggest communities but we have some smaller ones to do that we also operate and maintain. So we do that through contract. I have about 20 communities that I operate and maintain through contract. Um, Lion has their own system of wells that they use. So does Highland and o Oakland Township has a bunch and we operate and maintain all the ones that are yellow. So I operate all those systems. When you do, well, I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, so this is now the sewer systems. Again, like I said, each community contracts separately for water, but they all have systems that they collaborate in to take care of the sewage. So all these communities here in these yellow area with the hash stripes, um, all of those used to have all their sewage go down across to Macomb County and then go down this major uh, interceptor to be treated in Detroit. We have now taken 30% of the flow from these communities and we sent it to Pontiac. Pontiac had a wastewater treatment plant that was 80 years old, um, it's in bad shape. We're doing a bunch of improvements on it, but it was only being used by about a third of its capacity. So we said if we, had, if we could use all of that capacity, we could bring sewage for treatment from these communities, treat it here and save a lot of money because it's much cheaper to treat in Pontiac than it is in Detroit because of every dollar spent in Detroit on anything having to do with our wastewater treatment system, I mean, uh, their whole system, the Great Lakes Water Authority, 52% goes to debt. In Pontiac, it's not even 20%. So you're just by that, you're saving a bunch of money. So these folks are gonna be saving a lot of money. They also are, in, are contributing to the improvements to Pontiac so they can save that money, which means Pontiac doesn't have to do all those improvements themselves. They can afford it much better. So everybody is helped by this kind of new system and we're doing a, a, we're a whole bunch of work on that. So this is one of those things, those efficiencies we can bring in to, that the more people collaborate, the more efficient they can be. This is another part of function that my office does, erosion control. You've seen these fences here. Anytime there's any significant um, construction, it has to be over an acre or, and or within, I forget, uh, 500 feet or 300 feet of a body of water, a lake, stream, uh, a river. So anytime those things are met, we have to have that. And um, these brown, Communities here are the ones that I operate and maintain. We do all their erosion control for them. You guys are among them. The yellow ones do their own work. Um, we contract again. This is one of those things we contract for because we can do it cheaper on a larger scale. Um, so this is what we do. One of those, another one of those major operations that we do because erosion is one of the major polluters of our waterways across the country because every time these things, this silt gets into these waterways, it raises the bottom, it means the water has to spread out farther, it changes rivers. So we have to make sure we limit that as much as we can. 
but we're limited by the law. It has to be a certain size project. Um, this, I don't, you, you probably remember and you heard about the, uh, the big um, sewer collapse in Macomb County uh, Christmas of the, a year and a half ago, almost two years now. Um, this was a 11 foot pipe that was 100 feet underground, had been there for decades. Um, in the 20 years before this collapse, um, there had been two more collapses within two or three miles of this one. The last one they had, um, the engineers, after they uh, finished up the project and, and rehabilitated it, they said, well, you need to do an inspection of this pipe every single year. Well, they didn't do one for nine years, and then it collapsed. So the point is, you've got to make sure that you maintain this, these systems. You have to make sure you go in there and you look at the condition of them. You can't just let them go and assume they'll be OK. Because when this happened, it didn't just take out this driveway, it took out the sidewalk, it took out the road, it took down two houses, basically had to collapse. Uh, four more houses had to be repaired extensively because this, when, when the ground shifts 100 feet under, it pulls out from a long distance out. So it has a huge impact. This is, uh, this is one that was in, Rach uh, I believe this is in uh, um, uh, Bloomfield Hills. Uh, a fairly small break, but when, when you're breaking something, when you're fixing something and breaking it that's broken, it's three to five times as much as it is to do a planned replacement of systems. So anytime you're doing this, you're, you're throwing away money, and we're, that's one of the things we're trying to do. Um, this is not unusual, but this is a Pontiac. This is a map of all their um, sanitary sewer over, uh, systems. This is where they are now, and this is what we're looking at in 2037. All these orange ones and the red ones are even worse, are 80 years old or, or older. Over 75% of all their systems in, in the sewer side and the water side are over 80 years old. That means they're way past their life expectancy. Remember we had some really hard winters in 2013 and 2014. I'm sorry, 2014, 2015. Um, and in those, both of those two years, Pontiac alone saw about over 120 water main breaks in those two, each of those two years. Some of it was because they're being old. Some of it was because after they were put in the ground, they're supposed to be five feet underground, so there's no frost that can get under there. But over the time of replacing roads over and over again, we found some under Woodward that the, the top of the pipe was that far from the road. So that means every time it freezes, it's going to go down there and it, has, and it can crack those pipes. Did you see on Woodward? On Woodward in Pontiac. Oh, okay. So... Um, so if you're not careful, if you're not paying attention to this, you know, and again, often the oldest cities have the worst infrastructure, but they also have the, uh, the lowest uh, income, the least ability to pay for it. So we need help from the state in a lot of these cities, um, and that's what we're looking at. So here's the, uh, this, this is the water side, same basic thing. We're looking to replace all these things. And remember, when these were put in, in the, uh, if, if you, can, you can find fire uh, hydrants in Pontiac that have on the thing, 1908, 1912. That means they were put in and all the pipes leading to them are well over 100 years old. So this is not unusual to find this stuff in older cities and this is part of what we have to do is make sure that we make these things modern. When they put these things in the ground in the very early part of the century, they were expecting 40, 50 years of useful life out of them. 100 years later, we're putting in new technologies that we're expecting the life expectancy to be about 100 years. So. When we put these things in, they're going to last a lot longer than they are now, and as long as we have good asset management. Um, one of the things the state has done, unfortunately, one of the few things the state has done to help local folks pay for all this stuff, is SAW grants. SAW stands for Sewer Asset Management Wastewater Grants, and $400 million came out back in 2013, my first year in office. Uh, Oakland County got the biggest of anybody in the, in the state because we're very uh, on top of those kind of things. Um, so we got $34 million in grants in Oakland County, mostly for the communities that we ourselves operate and maintain, but some of the communities we help get that, we, that they do their own work. Um, so what this allowed us to do is send our remote control video cameras on wheels down pipes. We can send them down to a pipe from about a foot and a half, I mean a, a eight inch size pipe, to a 15 foot pipe. You can send these down and they do a 360 recording of the entire inside of the pipe. That way we can then study those and see what kind of conditions it in and we rank them by condition of the piping. Asset management used to be a fairly standard uh, at a certain year you, you replace the pipes. Um, nowadays we can do much more uh, intense evaluation of the pipes. So 
Two pipes go in. Um, one in certain soil conditions can last 100 years. The other one can last 25 years. You just don't know unless you're inspecting them all the time to see what kind of condition they're in. So this allows us to do much better long-term planning. And like I said, when you're doing long-term planning projects, it's a third or a quarter or even less of, of the cost of doing emergency repairs as, as, as they come up. Um, this is just one of our standard ones. This is, I think, a, a 11 foot pipe, or it might be a, a 10 foot pipe. Um, and these are stormwater pipes. They're always much bigger because they have to carry stormwater rather than just sewage. Sewage pipes tend to be much smaller. But these are the kind of things that have to be replaced, and it ain't cheap. So maintaining things is always preferable than replacing something with brand new. Um, so stormwater is what those things contain, and that's our, really our biggest issue nowadays. Uh, way back in 73, 45 years ago now, um, they passed the Clean Water Act. A little after that, they passed the Clean Drinking Water Act. Um, what those did was regulate pollution from sources, point sources, things like pipes coming out of factories or chemical plants or wastewater treatment plants. Anything with a pipe that, dis that disgorges any kind of water that isn't pure is now regulated. That's something that didn't exist before. The last thing we have left that is not really properly or, or well enough regulated is stormwater, non-point source pollution. That means anything that comes off when the water hits those roads out here, parking lots, anything, immediately goes into a storm drain. Um, in this area, you've got combined systems, so they're actually treated. But when you have non-combined systems, stormwater goes right into a drain. When that happens, it's taking off everything in the road, cigarette butts, gasoline, oil, uh, brake dust. Brake dust is everywhere on roads and that has, it actually imitates estrogen in the environment and it can make in, uh, insect species become much more female than male, which means that has an impact on their survivability. Um, when you're finding 70-80% females of insects, that means that there's not being as much breeding going on. Insects are, are needed. So we have to make sure that everything that gets in those storm drains as much as we can is somehow stopped from being polluted. So that's what we do. Um, these are our, uh, our watersheds. <clears throat> you guys are in the biggest watershed in the county. It's almost twice as big as any of the other two, uh, the Clinton River. This here is where you guys are. This is the, um, well, most of it, is the uh, George W. Kuhn area combined system. Um, and so it's very, very populated, very dense. There's almost no, well, there's very little permeous pavement, I mean, uh, pervious surfaces. Um, everything's paved or roofed or something on it. Um, even grass is not that great. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but anyway, so all this here it gets into the water. Here, it's treated. Up here, it's not treated. So anything that gets, in the gets on the ground hits that, those streams, and it's carrying bad stuff with it. The best way to do take care of that in terms of both effectiveness and cost is green infrastructure. I'm going to talk about that in a minute, which is... Um, rain gardens and things like that. This is the Georgia Bukun treatment. This is where all your water and sewage and stormwater goes for treatment. Um, there's, uh, most people don't even know that it really exists, but we have a two, uh, basically a two mile long underground tank that goes all the way from here where uh, 12 mile and 75 where the, uh, the two hardware stores are. It's right behind there, Lowe's and, and Home Depot. Um, and then it goes all the way to 13 into Quinder. Um, underneath the, uh, the uh, Redwood, uh, the water park, underneath the golf course, underneath the dog park, all that is on top of our system. Um, it's basically 60 feet across, 25 feet tall. It's like a super highway underground. Um, you, we drive up there to do things all the time. Um, it's really a massive facility. Uh, what it does is when, on a normal dry day, sewage comes through here and then it's diverted and it goes down a trough and then sent to the Great Lakes Water Authority treatment plant in Detroit for treatment. When it gets, when it rains, any more rain that comes into that system would overwhelm that drain to the Great Lakes Water Authority and then it goes over a weir, which is like a dam, it's a big V-shaped weir, and it goes over that and then into a storage tank that holds about 60 million gallons. That 60 million gallons if that's as much rain as it gets, is held there until the storm's over and then it's drained out and treated in Detroit at their wastewater treatment plant. If more, if the storm is bigger than that storm, then it goes over another set of weirs into a second tank that holds about, and, about, about 60 million gallons in that tank. That tank is a storage and treatment tank. That means it has chlorine that's in there that is then shot into the water, 
sits there for a certain amount of time till it's effective, and then it's tested as the water goes out of that system into the Red Run drain. Um, it's tested under uh, direction of the DEQ. The DEQ measures us. We have had uh, virtually a perfect record in the years that this has been built. This was finished in 2007. Um, and we have almost perfect record. We've had a couple of more that exceeded in those 11 years, but um, not enough to, to trigger any kind of reaction from the state. So as a rule, the state standard we treat to is called full immersion. That means you can swim in it and it won't hurt you. Um, and that's what we release into the Red Run. Once, it comes, once the Red Run leaves our facility, there's a whole bunch of drains that come into it all the way out to Lake St. Clair. When it hits Lake St. Clair, it just goes out into the water um, and with carrying whatever is added to that going down the stream. Um, so that's how this system works. Uh, it's the only way stormwater is actually treated before it's released. If it's a separated system, stormwater is not treated before it's released. This is a rain garden. See these, this over here is a little chart showing um, different root depths for plants. If you look over way over here, you'll see a little teeny thing of lawn grass. Lawn grass, if you keep your lawn about three inches tall, that means the roots are about four and a half inches underneath the ground. When, when it's very shallow root systems, water can sheet over it like it's concrete. Water, if, you, if you look at a really heavy rain out on a person's yard, you can see water sheeting off that like it's, like it's concrete, like it can't absorb. When you have plants that have much deeper roots, as the water runs across those plants, the root systems take the water down into the ground. That's, what mean, that's why rain gardens are very effective, because even though you have very short roots here, when it hits here, it's going to absorb in the ground much, much faster. This one here is often built with some kind of gravel or something that can hold water directly here. Very, uh, the roots take it down there, and then you have something here that when, when it's overwhelmed in a big storm, it will eventually go off into a, into a drain. Um, but other than that, it goes right into a drain. So anytime you're, if you can do a thing like this, you can keep that first inch of water from reaching the stormwater system, you're gonna, that means uh, the storms will have much less of an effect on the George W. Coon. You'll be paying less because you'll be less going into the system. So this is the kind of things that we can do. There's also rain barrels, which again, you can hook up to your hose and, and you know, water your garden with. Pervious pavement, uh, actually, I think Royal Oak is doing a, some work with pervious pavement. Farmington Hills has done that too. Um, I really like the idea of it. It's, it's a way of making sure that the water can go through it without sheeting off it. Um, I'll tell you, we have one parking lot in, Pon in Farmington Hills that they did half with Pervious and kept the old one on the other half. You go there in the winter. You know how on a, uh, if there's snow on, the, on a parking lot, the sun comes out, it melts the snow, and then it refreezes as, and it becomes ice, and it becomes kind of dangerous. Well, when it thaws, it just goes right into the ground. Instead of, instead of refreezing here and causing uh, slipperiness, I, you go out in that parking lot and it's like day and night. It goes from ice to nothing immediately. It's, it's impressive. Um, so there's, there's paybacks other than just saving water to that kind of thing too. Um, so, so really, we're protecting water quality. Now most people think of water quality as, as you know, what you're drinking, which is you know, good. Um, the Great Lakes Water Authority that we get that comes out of the plants that they have is extremely pure, some of the purest in the country. Um, they are very, very thorough in what they do with protecting our water. The issues that we tend to have with water quality like they had in Flint is in the homes themselves or in the water leads going into those homes that are lead. Um, any system that serves more than 12 homes in America has to live under the, uh, the lead and copper rule. One of that, what that means is for every year, uh, every year you have to test the water quality of everybody that gets water from you. Um, we test every year in, f in all the communities we, we service, like Farmington Hills, Commerce, Pontiac, like I said before. Um, and in all the testing we've done, uh, and as far back as I've looked, we've had non-detect and lead. So we, we don't have lead in our water systems here. That's because we use something called corrosion control. Corrosion control is, a, is a, a chemical that's added to the water of every drop you get it from a, a, source of, a commercial source of water has corrosion control in it. It's called orthophosphate. Orthophosphates are in our body. It's all through our cells. It's a natural, com uh, a natural thing that's in every, every uh, living creature's uh, cells. It's not, it's not a pollutant. It's nothing that's going to harm you. But what it does is it lines the inside of pipes. It sticks to pipes. 
Um, so it, it lines an inside of a lead pipe, a lead line, or a, up until 1972, uh, lead was allowed in solder in plumbing. It's not anymore. But if you have a home from 1972 or earlier, you might have lead in your solder in your piping. But what this corrosion control does is it covers everything. As long as you have a, a maintenance flow of it in your system, it'll always be covered. What they did in Flint was the emergency manager decided that they could save $50,000 a year by not doing that anymore. Um, if I told my engineers that, they'd quit. They wouldn't allow that to happen because they understand that if you stop that, that means that's going to wear off and then you're going to have lead problems. I will tell you this, in um, both Wayne County and Macomb County, in the past 30 years, which is, I, I think they've gone farther than that, but they, in the past 30 years of research, every time there's a high blood level recorded, there's a, uh, the health department has to do a, a research onto how that lead happened, that lead poisoning happened. In all the last 30 years in both Wayne and Macomb County, there's never been a case where it's been linked to water. Except for, well, Oakland County is kind of an exception, but the, the vast number of places in, in this country, it's, um, it's, it's not that. Um, it, uh, I'm sorry, I lost myself there. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I lost it. Um, the, uh, oh well, I'll come back to it. Um, so we, we do these testing all the time, every year, and every system does. So if you're, you should get a, a recording from this from your city every year. We don't do Royal Oak. Um, and look at it. it, it does heavy metals, it does all kinds of different bacterias, it does you know, lead and copper, um, uh, it does chemicals, industrial chemicals. Um, it, PFAS, you've heard about that. PFAS is one that the larger systems have to test for. Um, and again, in this area, we have not found any in drinking water. Um, so, uh, as I said, it's mostly your own infrastructure in your home. Um, one of the things for bacteria that people don't, don't think about often, the aerators in your, in your sinks. If you use uh, an, your sink every day, constantly, they stay wet. Anything that's dark and wet grows bacteria. It's just how nature is. There's going to be bacteria in. If you go home and take off your, your uh, aerators off your faucets and clean them out, you're going to see black gunk coming out of them. Every, I try to clean mine every few months at least, just to make sure that there's nothing growing in there. Um, it's one of those things that people just don't realize it could be a potential problem. Um, even, even in filters, where you have filters to protect yourself against some things, bacteria can grow in those filters. So you got to be careful about that too. Um, every, there's all kinds of tips around um, your water. If, if you're going to drink water, I would let it run for a minute until it gets cold to make sure that it's water from the outside and it's not water that's been sitting in your, in your pipes for a long time. Again, if you have an older home, there might be something around that for lead. Um, you just heard recently about the schools in Detroit. They found lead. Um, big buildings like schools do not have lead leads because lead is not good for larger pipes. It's good for small pipes. Um, so really, the only source of lead in a school like that would be um, within the, uh, the actual uh, faucets or, or drinking fountains themselves because, like I said, the, the, the orthophosphate lines everything, but when you have something that you're constantly turning, it can scrape that lining off. So until 2014, um, the, the feds allowed uh, lead in brass fixtures. So any, any fixture, most of your fixtures in your house are going to be the actual stuff itself is going to be brass because it's very sturdy. Um, and there, until, seven, until 2014, there was a certain amount of lead in that, too. Um, and especially these ones in Detroit, the older faucets are, were, were not built to, to, with these kind of things in mind. So they're doing these new with the bottle filling stations that are also a, um, a, uh, a, a drinking fountain. And those have built-in filters that they can change pretty easily. So those are the kind of things that we're doing now. All, pretty much all our schools, my understanding is, in Oakland County have had those replaced. So almost every school you're going to go into, they're going to have those filling stations, and you know those are safe because they're filtered. Lead can be filtered. PFAS can be filtered. All those things can be filtered. Um, again, we do the testing for lead. Um, if you're interested in testing for lead or bacteria or anything, you can go down to the health department. They have a little test kits for different things. Um, the one for lead is $24, and um, you, they give you little instructions on how to test for it. You send it away to the state and they'll send you back a report of what's in there um, if you're interested in doing that. Uh, again, 
The vast majority of homes here are going to be fine with lead. We, we're very thorough with our with uh, corrosion control. PFAS. Now you've heard a lot about PFAS recently. PFAS is a, an industrial chemical that was used um, for waterproofing, for uh, fire uh, suppression. It's used in a whole bunch of different things. Um, a lot of it around military bases. They use a lot of fire fire uh, suppression there. Um, there's some issues in uh, around uh, the Air, Naval Air Station, Macomb County, um, out west, uh, where they had factories that made boots and things, where they use that for waterproofing. Uh, wherever they're finding those kind of things, they're finding it contaminated in the water. Um, one of the things the state told us to do right away was to um, do a survey of all industrial processes in the whole area um, to see if they are now or in the past have used PFAS. All these industrial areas use something called, um, well, there's a program called Industrial Pretreatment Program, which we go to everybody that produces anything in sewage that might not be immediately treatable by a normal standard process. We either have them treated on site or we make them pay for us to treat it on site. Um, so that way, you know, it's, it's always treated. And that way we will know exactly who's used PFAS. My understanding is the survey has turned up nothing in this area that used PFAS. Uh, I haven't seen, the, it, it hasn't been finished yet. So, so far we haven't found anybody that uses PFAS here. Um, and we have not found any in the water that we test. Again, we operate well systems around the county, like I mentioned before, and we test for that stuff all the time. We have not found any of it. The Great Lakes Water Authority tests for PFAS in all their water systems, and they have found none in their systems either. Um, where it is, it can, be, it can be a real issue, but where it isn't, it doesn't like travel up aquifers. And we're the source of all these aquifers in Oakland County. It's not traveling up it's going to travel down and we haven't found any to travel anywhere else so we're doing okay on that and i think we'll be we'll be fine um there are like i said there are uh processes for filtering that out of water and we've told the communities that we're working on a on a proposal that they can go ahead and do it right now and just as a prophylactic or they can wait till this is some kind of indication that there's going to be a pfas uh, con uh you know contamination and then they could do it then but like I said, it's now that PFAS is something that's known and they're going to really limit the ability of people to use it unless they use uh, really extraordinary methods of keeping it on site. Um, I think that's going to be what we're going to do long term. Um, we can't filter out of drinking water, but there's nothing that shows we can take care of it in the environment. Um, there's nothing that, that there's no real theory as to how we could limit its impact on the environment. Um, they pointed out a few weeks ago that um, Kent Lake, which is the uh, uh, metro park over there, uh, at, right almost at the out of the county. Um, Kent Lake and then downstream from there in the Huron River, they're finding significant um, impacts of PFAS. So there, there's an advisory not to eat fish out of those rivers. Um, I wouldn't eat fish out of those rivers anyway because of uh, mercury, but um, to me, uh, this, this could have a significant impact because we're not sure what the impact on fish are. We're really just coming to terms with the impact on humans are, um, and we really don't have any kind of scientifically set level that is safe or not safe, um, and they're working on that. So in the meantime, I would anybody that might come up with, with a, a well water with an issue, they should report to the health department. Right now, the tests are about $500 to test for PFAS, which means it's kind of out of reach of a lot of people. Um, like I said, you can test for lead for 24 bucks. That's reasonable, 500 bucks, I don't know. Um, but we haven't found it here, and until we do, I, I, we really shouldn't panic. Um, it's, I heard somebody on NPR the other day say, well, everywhere they've tested it, they've found for it. No, that's just not true. They've, we've tested for all over the place, and nobody's found it. Are they still using PFAS in the environment? Uh, my understanding is they've called a halt to it, and nobody's using it right now, but there's a lot out there in, in fire extinguishers, in, in, in shoot boots you have at your, at your house that if you throw in a garbage dump might end up leaching into the ground. So there's a lot of questions about it. Um, but my, as of now, I don't think they're allowing it to be used anymore. And I, I want to point out that there's a staggering num number of chemicals that have never been tested for what their impacts are on humans. Um, there's constantly new chemicals being patented. And regulations are just years away from some of these things. So we just don't know. We kind of stumbled across the impact of PFAS. And it's been used for decades. So it's one of those things that if you don't have good regulation, you're going to have problems that, that things just slide under until suddenly becomes aware of it. And then you're going to have a real issue. 
So about how long ago was it identified? Did you find out about it? I've just, you know, it became a real issue when the EPA did a report, I want to say late last year. Um, the, uh, the, the White House actually tried to, to, to bury it, but um, it got the, the, the uh, um, inspector general let it, let it out. So um, it's, it's, it's an issue that we really have to come to grips with, that there's things out there that we haven't even discovered yet, and we have to make sure we, we understand that. Um, there's a couple of things that are really affect us in terms of rates and impact on our living life quality is fats, oils, and grease. This is something we're doing a big campaign around now. We're giving out, these actually, these two things are bookmarks that we give out to people. This is grease inside a pipe. This is about a two foot pipe, which means normally two foot of sewage flows through this. Well, you're gonna get about six inches of fluid flowing through this, which means when that happens, you have backups. Um, two years ago, almost now, uh, in Farmington Hills, we had a backup that hit 14 apartments in an apartment complex. And it turned out to be, a, a, well, we're assuming um, there's a McDonald's and a Burger King right up the ways a little bit, and they were probably not properly disposing of their waste. They have to report to us and the health department how they dispose of grease, but they weren't. So it blocked up a pipe, sent sewage into 14 people's homes, um, and it's just part of what, what happens. Um, last year, we spent, my, my office spent about a little over $350,000 just in the 20 communities we service going to calls of sewer backups and the great majority were fats, oils, and grease. Two thirds of those were in the people's own lines. It hadn't reached our line yet and it was just in their stuff. So all we can tell them is they have to go get rotor rooter to root it out or something. Um, once it hits our lines and we have, a, we have things that, that root it out and suck it all back up again and, and clean out the pipe. So, that's something we do way more than we should. Does it require baby wipes and fall? Well, I'll get that one in a second. I, that's the next slide. Um, so, so, so this happens without baby wipes. Without baby, well, that makes it worse. But yeah, this is just grease. If you look at that, that's just grease. And it builds up pretty fast. Now, aside from restricting the flow of water, does that breed bacteria and other things? It can, but it's underwater, and the bacteria would go to the treatment plant. I mean, that's, it's, it all ends up in a treatment plant. It's just the hassle of doing, and again, sewage getting in your home, that is an issue. So um, that's, and this is one coming out of a manhole. It's just water coming out of a manhole, and it's way more common. Please don't put anything that could do. Even oil mixes with that grease, makes it a little bit more soft, but then it hardens again, and it just makes it bigger and bigger, and it flows. The other one is wipes. Wipes should be illegal. We shouldn't be able to call flushable wipes flushable wipes. Why they, do they do that? Why can't we do something as simple as that? FTC, I would love to see that happen. The Federal Trade Commission, that's, they're the ones that would recognize that. Um, I, I, because they will go down your toilet. They're flushable. But what they do is they don't, they don't fall apart. With toilet paper, by the time it's gone out of your house, it's just nothing. This stuff will coat anything. The first one gets on there and everything else sticks to it. So it, it starts and then it makes worse. There was, a, uh, there was one in, in London that was twice the size of those double-decker buses they have. 11 tons and it was almost all this stuff, which mixes with the fats, oils, and grease, but it's, this stuff makes it impossible. This and <laughs> I'm sorry, that, the fat bird they found over in Macomb yeah, County. Yeah. The, just those kind of things, and it restricts flow so badly. Um, even things like dental floss, you flush that down there, gets mixed up with this stuff, and then it's reinforcing it, and it's almost impossible to get out. You gotta have jackhammers to get it out. Um, and then this happens. This is a pump. This is a pump that's been soaked in rags, and once that happens, it can bend the blades in the pump. It can do significant damage. So not only do we have to clean this garbage out, we often have to replace, re repair or replace the, the facility in the first place. And again, this adds up tremendously. There's a huge cost to this. The only thing that could, should go in a toilet is what comes out of you and toilet paper. Nothing else should go in there. Um, so I, I, it's, it's a huge issue. Uh, so now we do a lot of projects. This is a, a waste, uh, I'm sorry, a, a water, tower we built in Pontiac, I'm sorry, Farmington Hills back in, uh, I think we finished in early 2014. Um, what this does is every day there's a peak usage. Every community, like I said, contracts with the Great Lakes Water Authority. Every day that community has a peak usage. That means the most is used. 
Middle of the afternoon usually is when it's done, um, when people are watering their lawns or using a whole bunch of water. So that peak is something we have to pay extra for because that means that that much more water has to come to that community or every community at that peak. If you can shave that peak off, then that clo we can do a new contract and that cuts our water costs way down. So what this does is when that peak starts to approach, they start releasing water out of this into our water mains so we get that water instead of the water that's at peak price. So at night, at off peak, is then we refill this tank. So every day that's done. And also they have a little generator in here that turbine that turns when they're releasing water. So that means they're generating electricity through that too. It's always, anytime water moves, you can generate electricity. So that was a good project. We spent about $8 million and they're, spending a they're, they're saving a little over $3 million a year. Less than two and a half years they're paying that off. So this is a real payback. Those kind of things can have a huge impact. Um, now this is the Pontiac plant I talked about earlier. This was built in, I think, the 1920s. Um, it's been redone a couple of times, but it was in really bad shape. We were finding things like opening up a, 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 a breaker box and just stuff would fall out of it. And it was just in really terrible shape. Had not been properly maintained. They just didn't have the money to maintain it. And there was so little flow that the, co the, the charges weren't enough to, to, to fill that up. So we took this system over. We diverted flow from those other communities. And now those other communities and Pontiac are paying to improve this system. One of the things we're doing is a new process. There's something called an anaerobic digester. That's what this is. We pull the solids out of the sewage. Then we put them through this process, which means bacteria in non-oxygen um, non environment, bacteria eats it all. To run a process, to run one of these um, you know, uh, loads through that takes anywhere from 22 to 30 days to process that. We're putting in this thing here. It's a biosolids handling. Where some, whenever, you're, whenever something's eating something, it also produces heat. So we're still using some of the heat off of this and ex adding extra heat to this process here. So the solids won't go directly into here anymore. They'll go into here first. They'll be exposed to heat and water, and it'll break down those cell walls. So now it'll go through here before it goes through here. Instead of taking 22 to 30 days, it's going to take five to seven days. So anywhere from four to five times as fast. So when you're producing, anything that's rotting produces methane. Methane is something that um, right now is natural gas. Most of our methane that we use in America is pulled out of the ground. It's been in the ground for 600 million years. We're releasing the atmosphere. That's what's warming the atmosphere. This will be producing methane within the atmosphere. So there won't be any adding to methane to the atmosphere. Instead, we'll be able to, we'll be, already we're using this to produce methane that we're running a generator on to power my, my facility here. Now we'll be able to produce four to five times as much. We'll still produce it to here, but now we'll be able to sell, sell it to the grid, lowering cost to all the communities that provide flow to the grid. And we'll be producing grade A sterilized fertilizer just like you get at Lowe's or, or, you know, Home Depot, but it's from a different source, but it's still perfectly safe and we can use it. And DC has this system. We're the third in the country to use it. Washington DC has used this for a couple of years and they sell it on the market and they make money from that too, which again, lowers the cost to the, to the rate payers. All these things are going to lower cost to the rate payers. Go ahead. Is that like malorganite? Malorganite. Well, um, I'm, I'm not that familiar. The dried waste, sterilized waste from Wisconsin? Or right. I, I've heard the name, but I'm not sure exactly what that one is. But yeah, it's, it's anything from generally horses and cows. Pig, too, but mostly horses and cows. But anyway, so really, but it's the same thing. It goes through a process of heat sterilization so we can sell it on the market and it can save a bunch of money that way, too. Or we can give it to the communities and they can use it for their community gardens and things like that. Um, so beyond lakes that, we do, we do a lot around lakes. We do a lot around lake improvement boards and lake uh, levels. Lake improvement boards, there's, um, how many are there? 50 lake improvement boards. These are lakes, each one of these names is a lake improvement board. Everybody that lives around a lake um, contributes towards the, the maintain, maintenance of that lake, uh, you know, uh, weeding, seeds, stocking fish, all those kind of things. Um, uh, if down here, you might notice, there's no lakes, but you know, where there are lakes, we have lake improvement boards. Um, Farmington Hills, that's where I live. We don't have any lakes. We have some big puddles, but other than that, we have rivers. Um, so this is one of the, I have a, uh, one of my staff is on every one of these. We're usually the communications, uh, the, the communications secretary. 
Um, but we have a seat on all those. And we also do um, lake uh, level controls. Lake levels, the, uh, if you live on a lake, if a certain percentage of the people who live on that lake sign a petition to the circuit court, the circuit court will then um, put out a, an official uh, court-ordered lake level. Um, what that means is you, 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 they'll want the lake at the level that's best for their recreational uses. Um, you don't want it too shallow or you'll hit bottom. You don't want it too deep or you're going to cause issues um, with, with lawns and you know, your, your yard disappearing. Um, so there, it can be, there can be fights over that. I'll tell you that. There, people have come to me. When I first ran, I walked on a, a walled lake um, and I knocked on a door and the guy complained about how high the water was and two doors down, he complained how low the water was. So you just don't know. People have their own taste, but that, that has caused conflict. But um, we have each one of these lakes has a dam. So if the water is too high in the spring from rains or something, we let it go so it stays at that level. And a lot of them also have augmentation wells, which means if it gets too low, we have a well that we can just take water right out of the ground and put it into the lake so it keeps it at that level. Um, again, the people on the lake pay for the cost of doing that. Um, but we do a lot of those too. Um, now, a lot of people who live on lakes don't realize the impact that their property has on a lake. Um, last year we had 28 beach closings um, in Inland Lakes in Oakland County uh, because of algae and bacteria. The reason algae and bacteria gets out of control is because bacteria exist everywhere. Bacteria is just everywhere. Um, but it only eats what's available as food to them. What happens is people who have property that goes grass, you know, lawns that go right up to the edge of the water, every time it rains, whatever you put on that water for fertilizer, goes, on that gra uh, grass for fertilizer, goes right into the water. The bacteria thrives on phosphorus and nitrogen. Those are food for them. So the less food you can keep out of that water, uh, the more food you can keep out of that water, the less algae and bacteria will grow and you won't have beach closings. So we really encourage anybody who lives on, on water, riparian people, that means you live on water, put in a riparian buffer. Like I said, these kind of plants here, if you put in, if you take out grass like six, eight feet from the water's edge, take that grass off, mix the water in with some, uh, mix the dirt in with something that's even a little bit better at absorbing water, and then plant these roots, these plants have really deep roots. And all that water will sheet off the grass, hit this, hit this more pervious place, and sink right into the water. And you'll only get a little bit of water, even in a good storm, that will actually reach that water um, from your, directly from your lawn. So that limits the amount um, that they can get there. This is a book, there's, one over, there's a bunch of them over there, um, that kind of goes into why it's needed, how the causes of it, and, and advice on how to build these things to make it really very effective. Uh, repairing, repairing issues are very uh, um, controversial, and, and that would people, a lot of people would say that that would be a huge interference. I, I don't know. I, I would love to see um, much more encouragement of it. I don't know if you want to make it a law, because people will resist yeah. it. Um, but <laughs> I know what you mean. I know what you mean. But I'll tell you, you know, I go fishing a lot. I love fishing. I fish all over Oakland County. And Every time, every year when I go fishing, I see more people doing this. And, whoops, and that, I think, is going to be our solution, just recognizing that there's a role to play here and that we can do that. Um, so I, I do a lot around water, but I don't do everything around water. Um, wells are not my thing. My office doesn't really do anything with wells. Um, this, the health department does. When you're drilling a well, they have to authorize you to tap it, to actually open the well. When you're abandoning a well, they have to oversee you filling that well up with concrete. So, but other than that, there's no regulation of wells. That's why I always encourage anybody on a well, test your water every two or three years, just to make sure you're not having an issue with um, uh, as, uh, arsenic. Arsenic is a heavy metal that we do have issues with in Oakland County from some places, uh, not so much this part of Oakland County, but more up northern part. Um, it's a natural occurring thing, um, and, it, and it flows. So. You can have a, a, a detect for arsenic in your, in your water and next year test and there's none. It just flows. But like I said, with lead and any other metal, there's filters that you can put on your well that will filter that out and you don't have to worry about it. So um, septic systems, they do regulate septic systems. Um, they can condemn a septic system. Um, the DEQ estimates statewide that up to 20% of all septic systems in the state are now failing. Um, most of them were built 50, 60 years ago, and their expectancy is about 40 to 50 years. So 
That has an impact on, impact on, the, uh, on a lot of things. Um, Lower Pettibone Lake, out by uh, Kent Lake, a few years ago, um, it, we came to our attention that 25 homes right along the lake, all their septics were failing. Um, the, the health department and the DEQ were you know, l l heading towards condemning their property because you're producing a, a pollutant. Um, and they worked together, and it took a while, a couple of years, but they built a pressurized sewer system that serves all their homes, goes up to the uh, land above, and then has a septic field above that. Um, that cost almost a million dollars for 25 homes, $40,000 a person. Um, when your septic systems fail, you have two ways of dealing with it. You can build an engineered system, which can cost 40 or 50,000, and there's no guarantee they'll work more than a couple of years. Or you can find yourself ending up getting hooked up to some kind of sewer system, because you can't just let um, pollution go. And that lower Pettibone Lake right across from all those homes is a state park. And you could see the sewage literally seeping through their yards. So this is an, an issue that's going to affect our environment for a long time in Michigan. And a lot of the people who aren't live on septics, they can't afford to change that. So the state's going to have to come up with some kind of way of helping people do that if they want to stop all this pollution. And you know, like I said, lakes and beaches, we're having issues with um, phosphorus and nitrogen. That, that means closing of beaches, and we've got to do something about that, too. And they do, they test that, the health department does. Question, is, a, is that in part because of lack of maintenance of the septic system? You know, you see commercials for the uh, oh, things that's you can part pour of in. It. So, okay, that's right, part because of if you're not doing that and it fills up too much, it can't function anymore, right. and then it starts spilling without, being, without right. treating itself. Because it's the little bugs in there that eat the stuff, right. and, right. and if that if that gets to the point you can't do it, then that's when we have failures, mm -hmm. and that can lift up the top of a septic mm -hmm. tank. I mean, literally can lift it up. So I wanted to say too um, to this lady's question about the beachfront property. In my opinion, city people can also do changes because my whole front yard and the whole backyard is all gardening. I have no grass whatsoever anymore. I'm 100% organic. I use no pesticides, no fertilizers, nothing. Absolutely nothing. And it's a balanced ecosystem. Um, the and, the, the bad garden. bugs take care of the good bugs. It's changing people's perception because everybody has to have these green lawns, you know, with no weeds, you know, and then they see my yard, my neighbor, my, my next door neighbor hates it. You know, she absolutely hates it. Every time I turn around, she's yelling at me because my yard is so non-conventional, you know. But in the grand scheme of things, you know, my yard is helping to keep, number one, the groundwater where it's meant to be. Exactly. Because, because the roots are going, as Plants like said, yours have much deeper roots. You know, exactly. the, the, I grow natives. And you yeah, know, she should be asking if you have any tomatoes for sale. I, I, I do, you know what? Honestly, I don't do veggies whatsoever. Oh, yeah. um, I, I don't do veggies. I do all, all native plants, and, and, and I do have some more in those. You know, but right. it's changing people's perception. Yes. So we all can, we can all, not only lakefront property, but city people can do it. Um. Waterford has a, uh, they, they have a bunch of lake associations and they've brought them all together to, to talk about just those kind of things, how people can, you know, educate themselves about this. And that's good. I mean, again, I've been in, I've lived here and I've lived all over the country. I live in California, Maine, Florida. People know water here. They care about water here more than any place I've ever lived. And, and people are very aware of it. And so it doesn't take a lot to, to educate folks and they're going to say, okay, I can do that. And so I, I think a lot of it is education. Um, the, we have, uh, our, again, Great Lakes Water Authority has a water residential assistance program. It's a, a program for folks who make, uh, who at or below the poverty level can uh, get a subsidy on their monthly bill and any um, back bill they owe will be paid over a couple of years. So uh, it's a really good program. If you know you or anybody you know has an uh, uh, issue paying their water bill, uh, contact us. We can get them in contact with them and, and they can really help you. They will subsidize $25 a month for two years um, towards your water bill and then up to $700 a month toward arrearages, uh, uh, up to $700 a year for arrearages for two years. So it's a really good program. It's helped a lot of folks, but we haven't spent all our money. We're trying to make sure anybody who's eligible can, can get hold of that. Um, and that's pretty much it for me. Well, thanks for coming. <laughs>